Uh, I'll briefly explain the reason why we thought of a joint symposium. It's uh, in fact a consultant uh, judiciary medical officer, uh, Dr. Prasad Nappuhami's uh, idea. He had, he had come across uh, about three, uh, four to five sudden cardiac deaths uh, premature sudden uh, cardiac deaths uh, over the last uh, four to five months and so. He rightly brought this to the notice of our uh, consultant and uh, yeah, then we uh, generally thought that it would be better uh, for us to uh, re-emphasize on this and educate the primary care physicians on mimics of ischemic chest pain uh, to prevent further such occurrences. So today we have a, a nice lineup of lectures. Uh, first, uh, it will, uh, Dr. Prasanna Puhami would uh, start off with a brief introduction onto the, this session, and which is uh, which, which will be followed up by uh, a, a brief present uh, a lecture by consultant chest physician uh, Dr. Manil Pires on uh, breathless uh, causes of breathlessness, and um, third lecture would be by Dr. Ranga Salagala, GI physician, uh, on uh, peptic culture symptoms that may mimic uh, ischemic chest pain. And um, our friend, uh, Dr. Dinush Dharmavadana, too, agreed to join via Zoom from Australia uh, to present on um, the cardiac causes. And finally, to brief up uh, Dr. Amir from uh, NH, uh, sorry, RDHS, who is the MONCD, will briefly present, present uh, on uh, referral system, uh, the um, currently prevailing referral system, uh, and he'll uh, just uh, update on the uh, uh, referral forms, which are available uh, for uh, NCD prevention. Uh, so I would uh, like to start the presentation. Uh, with uh, Dr. Uh, Prasanna Pwami's uh, presentation on sudden cardiac death in young. Over to you, uh, Prasanna. Thank you, Amma. And uh, I would like to thank Dr. Yapa also for gracing this event. And uh, Why did we uh, plan this activity? Now, from February 2022 to June, we had five cardiac deaths. They are very young, from 22 to 35. We had, we, we usually have most of our Cases are natural deaths. Out of the natural deaths, uh, cardiovascular disease predominant. But they are around 50, 60, 70s. But here, when you look, they are very young. The other thing that I want to emphasize is if you look at the last uh, the column, one before last. Out of the five, three had gone to a doctor before and they were treated for either gastritis. And if you look at the last 24 year old person, his elder brother was treated for ischemic heart disease. He is also a young person. So I think this tells us that. Uh, when we even when we get young people, you have to think twice whether are we really dealing with gastritis or whether there are things that we need to investigate further. Now, just a small uh, if you look at our annual health bulletin, uh, they say that uh, there is an increasing trend of ischemic heart disease, and it is the leading cause of death. Uh, uh, 
Now, this is, these are the statistics you could see. Uh, skin with heart disease is number one. Now, something that I want to emphasize here, uh, I took this from an article. They talk about prevalence of atherosclerotic coronary artery disease. They say, in, this is in USA, they say, there are about 17.6 million Americans who have ischemic heart disease more than 20 years. I mean, after 20 years, to see the, they don't talk about 35, they don't talk about 40, you know, they start with 20. So I think this is a good message to you. When you get a patient, you know, you have to think of ischemic heart disease. This is the message that I want to give. Now, this is another, uh, uh, this is another US uh, statistic. See, if you look at uh, coronary artery disease, they start from 18 years to 44, 45 to 60. So imagine, I will just present uh, the post-mortem. Uh, this is a 24 year old male. The sad part is his elder brother was treated for coronary artery disease. He's also a young person. Now in this, you could see the right atrium, right ventricle, and the left ventricle, you could see the disc, uh, this, but you would see over here, is the anterior descending artery, and you could see the uh, discolored area, that is the uh, myocardial infarction, I will show you later, and you could see, this is the coronary artery, and you could see the coronary artery thrombosis. And this is, uh, I have taken a section, you could see the coronary artery thrombosis. And you could, uh, now, this is the normal left ventricle. And you could see, this is the anterior wall, and this is the interventricular receptor. You could see the infarcted area, yellow infarcted area. And you could even see thinning. Usually thinning occurs when there is previous infarction also. The funny thing is, when you look at the stomach, you could see the erosion. So they can have epigastric pain. They can have gastric erosion. So they might come to you. They might complain about the gastric erosion and that symptom rather than the chest pain. So, something to think about. And uh, what I really need to give an input from uh, Dinush, Dr. Manin, Dr. Talagala about when a patient comes to you, how detailed that you need to take history, how you should examine, what are the investigations, to rethink whether the way that we are managing patients are uh, correct. So thank you. And uh, I would like to uh, invite uh, Dr. Manin Piri to uh, give his lecture. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, so uh, this is a very broad topic. So uh, I will just briefly uh, go through it uh, because it's so broad that 
I mean, it's uh, this lecture, but I just sort of uh, trying to uh, give you uh, just a reminder. Recording of, in uh, progress. Uh, reminder of uh, uh, what, what's needed. So um, we all know what is dyspnea. It's a sensation uh, of uh, breathlessness and a patient's reaction to the sensation and uh, the feeling of shortness of breath or chest tightness or difficulty breathing. As you can see, as Dr. Uh, uh, Prasanna mentioned, uh, 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 I have a lot of uh, uh, overlap. Uh, so if we take the pathophysiology of dyspnea and, and the descriptor, that is the, the symptom that the patient comes in, uh, some of the uh, common symptoms which we have is that the patient comes and says chest tightness or constriction, which is a very common symptom. Uh, from my point of view, it is mainly bronchoconstriction, but of course, still, it can be a presenting feature of interstitial edema, especially uh, uh, also in myocardial ischemia and asthma. Then some patients come and tell you that there is increased work or effort of breathing. Uh, and uh, these are more in favor of uh, airway obstruction, neuromuscular diseases, uh, COPD, which is commonly uh, uh, breathlessness on exertion, which is progressive, uh, as opposed to asthma, which has a history of episodic uh, 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 worsening symptoms with uh, complete normalcy in between. Uh, but the increasing work or effort of breathing can be severe asthma. And uh, of course, neuromuscular disorders like myopathies and kyphoscoliosis can also uh, give the similar symptom. Then, of course, some people come and say, I'm, I, I, I don't have enough breath, air hunger, need to breathe, urge to uh, breathe is uh, another common symptom uh, where there is increased drive to breathe and these uh, commonly are due to uh, chronic heart failure. Pulmonary embolism is something which we need to uh, think of uh, which uh, was quite uncommon in Sri Lanka, but uh, we are seeing more and more cases over the last one or two years since uh, um, uh, we are having this pandemic. And of course, uh, moderate to severe airflow obstruction will also uh, give similar symptoms that is in COPD and asthma. Then also uh, some patients come and tell you cannot take a deep breath. Or, uh, or they feel that they, are, they have uh, an inadequate breathing effort. Uh, usually this is uh, uh, in our uh, setup in respiratory, uh, it is due to asthma or COPD because they have hyperinflated lungs and so they, they cannot, they breathe in very little actually because the lungs are already hyper expanded. Or if there is restricted tidal volume like in pulmonary fibrosis, chest wall restriction disorders, Again, uh, this sort of uh, thing can occur. Also, uh, uh, some patients pre present with heavy breathing, rapid breathing and breathing uh, more. And this is usually, and again, uh, uh, this is a very common uh, presentation these days uh, with the pandemic. A lot of people have got deconditioned, the lack of exercise, being at home, uh, young people, school going children, uh, lack of exercise, is a major issue and we get a lot of patients coming with uh, this uh, symptom. But if you look at the uh, causes of dyspnea, I'm not going to go through this list, you can go through any book, but uh, as you can see, uh, you have uh, cardiac causes, all the sort of cardiac causes can give rise to breathlessness. Respiratory wise, nearly all of the respiratory conditions will give the symptom of breathlessness. But uh, uh, I just want to sort of highlight that hematological causes are quite common. We get like quite a lot of patients coming with breathlessness found to be anemic. Uh, again, abdominal causes like ascites, we have had two or three patients in our ward with respiratory symptoms, personal breath over the last few uh, weeks uh, with ascites and gastroesophageal reflux disease and hyperthermias presenting with shortness of breath and cough. And also metabolic diseases like thyroid disease and uh, Cushing's and even diabetes coming with ketoacidosis uh, mm. with acidotic breathing patterns. And a lot of psychogenic patients coming in now uh, with anxiety and panic attacks. 
then of course uh, uh, neurological disorders affecting the chest breathing patterns any uh, of these conditions can cause this and of course uh, as i said earlier physiological causes like of exercise normal aging can lead to breathlessness and deconditioning and obesity and obesity uh, again is something which we are seeing more and more uh, due to lack of exercise and uh, staying at home and uh, in our setting obesity associated with obstructive sleep apnea or uh, obesity hypoventilation uh, syndrome which are two sort of very similar conditions uh, can uh, lead to this type of uh, symptoms and of course there are other conditions which we need to think of so if we think of breathlessness it's it's uh, uh, the pathophysiology it can be either in the airways causing obstruction or it can be in the chest wall and in the lung parenchyma which lead to stimulation of the nerves going into the brain stem uh, which can lead to the feeling of breathlessness uh, or it can be due to uh, uh, altered uh, vq uh, and hypoxia leading to keratotic body stimulation by the low uh, oxygen and high carbon dioxide or it can uh, be due to the respiratory failure leading to high carbon dioxide being detected by the central chemoreceptor so all these cause this breathlessness it's a combination of these factors in many cases so in general practice if you take uh, uh, these days i think uh, uh, there are a large number of patients coming with acute bronchitis uh, going on to get even respiratory failure these days uh with this viral infection going around uh, at the moment um large number of patients coming with acute bronchitis uh, uh upper respiratory infection is also uh, quite common these days and uh, other infection bronchial asthma and uh, uh, with this uh, acute bronchitis uh, viral bronchitis we are seeing lots of uh, patients getting acute exacerbations of bronchial asthma as well as COPD these days and uh, coming with chest tightness chest pain sometimes uh, what they complain is chest pain but actually when you ask them it is actually chest tightness and of course uh, we need to always think of heart failure hypertension and cardiac disorders uh, uh, again uh, in these patients uh, this is a crowded slide but i think i'll just go through some of these so history is very vital uh, to get a good history is very vital as dr prasanna said it can be a combination of factors also the quality and the sensation uh, uh, as i mentioned uh, will give you a clue to the diagnosis and the timing uh, like if you take asthma it is more at night early morning while if you take copd it is progressive shortness of breath Uh, with exertion and at night uh, once they go to sleep they they are not very breathless uh, and that sort of uh, information is very vital to get in the history so that you can differentiate between the diagnosis again positional disposition like paroxysmal nocturnal dyspneas uh, which are more uh, cardiac than uh, others but of course uh, again orthopnea can be a feature uh, of uh, breathlessness even in asthma and copd uh, when they are in the severe uh, uh, state and of course persistent versus intermittent symptoms should be uh, uh, especially in uh, differentiating between asthma and copd uh, this is an important clue in the history when you take the physical examination Uh, of course uh, there are many patients in the respiratory uh, arena where we can look at them and say this is probably copd uh, uh, and of course uh, looking at the patient you need to see that uh, see whether the patient is in respiratory failure uh, just see that the patient uh, can he talk a full sentence uh, use of accessory muscles and then looking whether the patient is cyanotic uh, by just looking at the patient and of course vital signs are very important and uh, looking at uh, tachypnea tachycardia uh, of course pulses paradoxes is there in all the books but we don't practice this very often uh, but i think a very important factor with the pandemic which we have uh, uh, 
uh, what you used to is looking for oximetry. I think many of the doctors now have an oximeter with them. So that should be a basic uh, uh, investigation done like the blood pressure, pulse, and oximetry should be a part of the basic workup of any patient, especially in these days. Uh, then looking at the chest, uh, looking for wheezing, because wheezing is a, a, a major feature of uh, obstructive airway disease, but also you need to keep in mind that even with heart failure, you can get some wheezing in addition to the other features of heart failure. And of course, you can have diminished breath sounds in a very acute severe uh, COPD or uh, in an acute severe asthmatic state. And in hyperinflated lungs, usually in uh, chronic uh, severe asthma and COPD. Then, of course, cardiac examination, looking for elevated JVP, precordial impulse, and gallop rhythms, looking for cardiac uh, uh, insufficiency, cardiac failure. And of course, uh, looking for peripheral edema, which may be a feature either of copulmonale or cardiac disease. So uh, the physical examination, history and physical examination is a vital part in this. And uh, that will give you clues to the diagnosis of this. Uh, again, um, uh, just to sort of go through uh, some of the sort of critical diagnosis, the emergent diagnosis, and uh, 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 of course, the non-emergency diagnosis. Uh, well, if uh, they become with uh, uh, pleural effusions, neoplasm, COPD, pneumonias, will come with a history of shortness of breath. They are not acutely unwell. If you are thinking of a very acutely unwell patients, spontaneous pneumothorax should be thought of, pneumonia, aspiration, copabonale, and asthma. And of course, in the critical diagnosis, you need to look for uh, features of pulmonary embolism, which is, as I said earlier, we need to be looking for these. Uh, usually, these people have uh, normal breath sounds, tachycardia, tachypnea with low saturation. So if you have this triad, think of pulmonary embolism as well these days because uh, that seems to be the rising tendency. Again, airway obstruction, uh, non-cardiogenic edema, anaphylaxis and ventriparia as a part of the pulmonary uh, syndromes. Then of course the cardiac syndromes, the typical uh, ones which will be talked about by Dr. Dinoosh. I'm not going to go into that. And of course, uh, just uh, sort of uh, mentioned that even abdominal uh, things, which will be uh, giving rise to uh, uh, breathlessness. Uh, again, a uh, lot of people uh, uh, also are now coming in with psychogenic causes of breathlessness uh, should be looked for and uh, history and uh, examination. Uh, in most instances, it is enough to diagnose this condition. You don't need further investigation. Uh, then, of course, metabolic causes, especially uh, uh, in the acute setting, in the critical setting, um, uh, diabetic ketoacidosis, uh, where they come with the symptom of acidotic breathing. So acidotic breathing is different to the other types of tachypnea and shortness of breath. Uh, uh, as you see it, you know, this is this looks like acidotic breathing. So it's like <sighs> that sort of breathing. Uh, and uh, also uh, infections uh, can come with breathlessness and the symptoms, very similar to even cardiac symptoms. Um, and uh, also never miss attention pneumothorax, cardiac tamponade or a flail chest. So uh, those are some things which I just wanted to highlight here. So uh, some other just additional symptoms and signs which you may get, uh, if there is diminished or absent uh, breathing sounds, it may be acute severe COPD, severe asthma, uh, tension pneumothorax needs to be thought of because you are not hearing the breath sounds, pleural effusions, uh, and of course, uh, hemothorax. Then if the, the, there is distension of neck veins with wheezing, then think of ARDS and AD, uh, heart failure. 
with normal auscultatory findings being of pericardial tamponade and acute pulmonary arterial embolism, uh, which is an important thing which you need to diagnose immediately. And uh, we now have CTPA facility in Matale, uh, which we uh, use quite often, and we have had several positive cases. Then, uh, if the patient has uh, dizziness and syncopate in cardiac diseases, and of course, if there are uh, uh, hyperdynamic uh, dysfunction like hypertension, it can be a hypertensive crisis, panic attack, acute coronary syndromes. And if they are hypotensive, then of course, uh, metabolic disturbances, sepsis, uh, heart failure, and pulmonary embolism should be thought of. If there's hemoptysis, then of course, uh, you need to always think of lung cancer, pulmonary embolism, bronchiectasis, chronic bronchitis, tuberculosis. Of course, hemoptysis is quite common in acute bronchitis. We, uh, we are seeing uh, quite a lot of patients coming with acute bronchitis these days with a little bit of hemoptysis as well because they are coughing a lot. Uh, hyperventilation is seen in acidosis, as I said earlier, salicylate poisoning, sepsis, and of course, uh, psychogenic causes. Uh, impairment of con uh, consciousness can be uh, uh, psychogenic hyperventilation, cerebral or metabolic disturbances, and pneumonia associated with shortness of breath. Orthopnea uh, can be acute congestive heart failure and uh, toxic or pulmonary edema. And if there's pain on respiration, then we think of pneumothorax, pleural, uh, 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 pleural involvement with pneumonia and pulmonary embolism. And is independent of respiration, of course, uh, think of, uh, again, myocardial infarction, IPK aneurysm, uh, renal or biliary colics, and acute gastritis. And vice versa, there are patients coming with abdominal pain uh, who uh, can be due to pneumonia or any other cardiac cause as well. Then, of course, uh, uh, palo can be marked anemia, obviously, and uh, so on. So these are some of the other things you would be looking for in your examination to make this differentiation between uh, the cause. And it is vital that you make this differentiation because your management will depend on this. Uh, I will not go through this slide, this for uh, emergency uh, management in the uh, just a sort of very simple slide, uh, but I will just put it on onto our uh, uh, group so that you can look at it leisurely. Uh, I think I have gone past time also, so thank you very much. So we'll have the discussion uh, at the end. So uh, I'd like to call upon Dr. Ananda uh, Palagale, our consultant gastroenterologist, to uh, do the next. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Manuel.
Uh, good afternoon. Uh, uh, so today I will be going to speak about uh, approach to a patient uh, presenting with upper abdominal pain. So my topic would be gastritis might not be gastritis because uh, most of the patient uh, comes to us. Uh, they also come, uh, uh, they themselves uh, come up with the diagnosis of gastritis. What a gastritis. But it is our uh, job and our duty to explore the uh, symptoms and uh, arrive at the correct diagnosis. Uh, uh, technically speaking, actually the gastritis is not a uh, clinical diagnosis, not even an endoscopic diagnosis, although we use, uh, after the endoscopy, we give diagnosis as uh, pan gastritis or enteral gastritis. Actually, gastritis means it's a pathological diagnosis. So abdominal pain is a very common presentation and uh, the challenge is to distinguish uh, acute potentially life-threatening causes from acute recurrent abdominal pains caused by chronic relapsing conditions, which are not that uh, life-threatening. And also we should think about uh, non-gastrointestinal causes uh, in the workup of abdominal pain. Because uh, if you can remember uh, the, the initial slide, first slide of the Dr. Prasanna was, uh, the two patients were uh, uh, treated as gastritis. A high index of suspicion is needed in order to develop a broad differential diagnosis. Uh, so the, uh, the main thing is uh, we should stick to our basics. A comprehensive history with a good symptom analysis and a thorough examination is a must. So a few words about uh, the types of uh, abdominal pains that uh, we can, uh, the people uh, experience. So uh, there are five categories. The first one is visceral pain, parietal pain, referred pain, neurogenic pain, and psychogenic pain. So a uh, visceral uh, uh, pain arises when a noxious stimulus affects affects the abdominal viscous, resulting in poorly localized pain in the epigastrium, periambulical area or lower mid abdomen. This pain is usually midline as abdominal organs receive a sensory apparent input from both sides of the uh, spinal cord. The pain is poorly localized. The visceral pain is uh, poorly localized because innervation of most viscera is uh, multi-segmented. And uh, uh, this uh, visceral pain uh, can uh, occur due to several uh, mechanisms. The one is uh, uh, the spasm or stretching of the muscle wall of a hollow organ, uh, uh, for an example, is uh, intestinal obstruction. And also it could be due to distension of the capsule of a solid organ like liver. And also inflammation or ischemia of a visceral structure can also give rise to a visceral pain. And it is uh, generally a, a cramping, burning, uh, heavy or heavy dull in character. And uh, uh, this uh, visceral pain can be associated with uh, secondary autonomic uh, uh, effects such as uh, uh, sweating, nausea, vomiting, and pallor. Uh, whereas a parietal pain arises from noxious stimulation of the parietal peritoneum, and it is intense and more precisely located than uh, visceral pain. Rebound tenderness will be there and uh, if there's peritonitis, and it usually occurs directly over the affected area. And the, uh, if the patient is having pa uh, parietal pain, coughing and moving, uh, the movement of the body will aggravate it. Therefore, the patient prefers to uh, lie still. And uh, referred pain, this is in uh, today's context, this is the most important thing. So we should not uh, 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 miss a referred pain, uh, especially in the epigastric area of the upper abdomen. The, this uh, referred pain uh, felt in areas remote from the affected organ, and uh, it is supply the nerve uh, supply is by the same neurosegment with the shared central pathways for afferent uh, neuron uh, neurons from different sites. So it can be experienced in the skin or deep in deep, and uh, referred pain can coexist with the uh, original visceral pain as well. Few examples are gallbladder related pain referred to the uh, infrascapular region and the right-sided diaphragmatic irritation causing pain referred to right shoulder. This, this can occur in uh, lower lobe pneumonia and sometimes in uh, uh, pulmonary embolism and also cardiac pain referred to the epigastrium. So this, uh, this is a diagram uh, showing uh, uh, where the uh, referred pain can occur and the uh, uh, relevant organs. And the uh, neurogenic pain, it occurs along the distribution of a nerve and uh, commonly patients describe this as a burning sensation. 
the examples are herpes zoster and peripheral neuropathies as a result of previous surgeries and usually there is no association with eating or drinking or bowel movements this uh, neurogenic pain the, the one of the commonest uh, presentation is psychogenic pain and uh, it may uh, represent a physiological uh, response to psychological stress so okay as the consequence of a conversion reaction where no organic disease exists and this is a bit uh, difficult condition to diagnose and usually it is a diagnosis of exclusion so uh, uh, moving on to history uh, the history initial uh, differential diagnosis can be determined by a uh, delineation of the patient pain's uh, location radiation and movement and after the location is identified the physician should obtain general information about onset duration severity and the quality of pain about exacerbating and remitting factors and i uh, i will skip this uh, this slide because this is uh, the med uh, medical students stuff and and i will, but i will discuss uh, i will go through the, some of the tips uh, which can uh, narrow down our differential diagnosis if the patient is complaining of abrupt onset severe pain we should uh, think about a uh, uh, perforated visceral and uh, if the patient is having a uh, peptic ulceration the pain may improve after a meal and if the patient pain is due to mesenteric ischemia uh, it can occur postprandially and uh, if the pain is due to ibs the usually the pain is relieved by defecation and uh, colic pain uh, we know that uh, the colic pain uh, uh, relieve uh, by uh, moving position uh, whereas peritonism by lying still and if uh, If someone is complaining of a worsening of pain uh, with exertion, we should uh, think about acute coronary syndrome. Actually, a uh, uh, few weeks back, uh, I had a patient about 72 years old, male patient uh, with a background history of uh, uh, diabetes, hypertension, uh, came with uh, gastritis, but the, that pain uh, uh, increased with uh, uh, exertion. I I did the urgent ECG and there was there were deep T innovations and, and I did the urgent medical referral, but unfortunately pa patient did not uh, uh, agree to uh, uh, admit to the uh, ward. Uh, so in the in those kind of uh, uh, scenarios we have to be very very careful. And if uh, if someone is having uh, abdominal pain with fever, chills and dry goes, we should think of infective and inflammatory etiology and uh, if there's changes in appetite and especially a uh, unintentional weight loss we should think about malignancy and inflammatory conditions conditions such as ibd and if there's a history of pre existing indigestion or heartburn we should think about uh, a perforated ulcer or a further episode of uh, dyspepsia and if there's a change in bowel habits a uh, patient uh, like a uh, constipation diarrhea rectal bleeding or a pasi mucus it might indicate malignancy or inflammation but uh, in ibs as well uh, uh, sometimes patient complain of mucus the presence of mucus uh, does not necessarily indicate a malignancy or inflammation uh, but uh, there are possibility so uh, uh, then uh, in the history then we can uh, uh, localize the pain in relation to the underlying etiology so the usually the right upper quadrant pain uh, arises uh, from uh, pathologies uh, in uh, liver gall bladder and stomach but rarely the colonic uh, conditions uh, some uh, renal uh, uh, disorders and rarely inflammation of the right lower pleura may also give rise to pain in this area so acute in acute cholecystitis uh, there will be a right upper con uh, 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 pain with uh, Uh, fever and nausea, and uh, which can be provoked by eating, and we can differentiate this from uh, uh, biliary colic by its constant chronic nature. Whereas in uh, biliary colic, there will be severe spasmodic pain, and uh, in acute cholecystitis, uh, Murphy sign uh, will be uh, positive in the examination. We know that the Murphy sign is uh, uh, when we uh, palpate the right uh, hypochondric area. Uh, when we ask the patient to take a deep breath at the height of the uh, inspiration there will be severe pain or the tenderness and sometimes uh, uh, acute cholangitis can also present with uh, uh, upper abdominal pain so uh, typically uh, about 70% of the patient 
will have, have a charcot cholangitis triad, which is uh, abdominal pain, fever, and jaundice. So uh, the, these are the rare conditions. Uh, uh, hepatic, there are some hepatic conditions such as uh, hepatitis, abscesses, or mass. Uh, any condition which can give rise to a stretch of the uh, liver capsule will uh, cause right hypochondrial pain. And uh, pulmonary causes include pneumonia and pulmonary emboli, uh, renal causes, nephrolithiasis, and pyelonephritis. And uh, colonic, uh, sometimes colitis and diverticulitis can also come with this kind of pain. So epigastric uh, pain. So uh, uh, again, the uh, same biliary conditions, uh, uh, cholecystitis, cholelithiasis, cholangitis can uh, again come with epigastric pain as well. Uh, importantly, ca uh, uh, cardiac causes such as MI, pericarditis can also present with epigastric pain. And the other cause, the gastric causes, esophagitis, uh, uh, gastritis, peptic ulcers, and the pancreatic cause, uh, masses, and pancreatitis, uh, chronic co acute and chronic, uh, can also present with uh, epigastric pain. And uh, vascular uh, causes uh, they include uh, uh, aortic dissection and mesenteric ischemia, and also ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm. So, if this epigastric pain is due to a gastric pathology, usually patient will come, come up with dyspepsia or indigestion. So what is the definition of this dyspepsia? According to the wrong four criteria, uh, the definition of the uh, dyspepsia is any combination of these four symptoms. It is a postprandial fullness, early satiety, epigastric pain, uh, and epigastric burning. And these uh, uh, symptoms should be severe enough to interfere with the usual activities and occur at least three days per week over the last three months with an onset of uh, at least six months in advance. Usually, dyspepsia is, presence, uh, is associated with peptic ulcer disease or gastritis, uh, gastri gastroesophageal reflux disease, uh, functional dyspepsia, and sometimes very rarely with malignancy as well. So the other uh, uh, symptoms, if the... Uh, if the uh, epigastric uh, discomfort or the pain, uh, uh, if it is due to a, a GI pathology, the patient will complain of heartburns. The uh, heartburns uh, uh, is the uh, retrosternal burning sensation rising up through the throat. And this is the primary symptom of the uh, GORD. And sometimes uh, uh, other causes uh, can also be associated with the heartburns, such as uh, uh, non erosive reflux disease, reflux hypersensitivity and functional hardware. So the uh, next, uh, moving on to the uh, left upper quadrant pain, again, and the same, almost uh, similar causes uh, as we uh, discussed. Uh, the, here, the uh, additional thing would be splenic pathology, such as uh, acute infection with uh, EBV virus or uh, splenic infarcts. So clinical examinations, so this is again the medical student stuff. So uh, uh, some important things to highlight is if the patient is uh, pale, sweaty, or drowsy, if the patient is having a, a temperature, if the patient is uh, having a, a hemodynamic uh, uh, instability, uh, we should think about more. Uh, and also uh, in today's uh, topic, uh, if the patient is having an E onset murmur or a, a bilateral fine prep, so we should think about an uh, underlying more uh, severe pathology than simple gastritis. So this is a, a flow chart uh, that if the patient is having an epigastric uh, tenderness, uh, that we should uh, uh, go. Uh, I, I'm not going to go through this. And uh, I, I would like to uh, highlight few uh, important conditions. I don't know whether there will be an overlap with Dinush. Uh, so these are the uh, can't miss diagnosis, acute life threat. We should not miss acute uh, uh, coronary syndrome. Uh, it, it's typically manifest as chest pain in 40% uh, to 75% uh, of the cases, but can have atypical presentations, including no nausea, vomiting, and abdominal pain. And uh, uh, these atypical presentations are common in the uh, geriatric population, women and diabetic patients. And uh, the uh, pathophysiology is due to the referred pain. 
and uh, we should have a, a low threshold to rule out acute coronary syndrome in high risk patients presenting with non specific abdominal pain uh, such as uh, uh, background medical history if there's a history of diabetes hypertension is past history of ischemic heart disease uh, and dyslipidemia and uh, we we all know that uh, the work up of uh, acute coronary uh, syndrome include uh, ecg and cardiac enzymes so if cardiac etiology is ruled out further investigation into other etiologies is warranted so another important category is aortic emergencies which uh, consists of uh, mainly aortic dissection and ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm and uh, uh, aortic dissection typically present with tearing uh, chest and back pain but can present with isolated abdominal pain especially in type b dissections and uh, uh, the other condition is ruptured or symptomatic abdominal aortic aneurysm uh, present primarily with acute severe abdominal pain associated with hemoperitoneum usually causing hemodynamic instability and the risk factors for aortic pathology include uh, male gender age more than uh, 63 years age uh, yes and a history of hypertension smoking and non connective tissue disorders are also uh, other predisposing factors evaluation often uh, begin with cardiac work, work up and a chest x ray may show widening mediastinum in the uh, type a aortic dissection and the bed, uh, urgent bedside ultrasound is is a must so this is a, a, a chest x ray uh, of a uh, uh, aortic dissection uh, which shows the widening of the uh, mediastinum and uh, as i mentioned earlier sometimes uh, pulmonary embolism uh, also rarely can present with uh upper abdominal pain and we should not miss uh, the <clears throat> diagnosis and also congestive heart failure uh, especially in the uh, children and adolescent uh, with dilated cardiomyopathy can present with right upper quadrant pain and nausea and vomiting again uh, as i mentioned earlier pneumonia uh, can present with uh, uh, atypical presentation of pneumonia can uh, 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 the there can patients come present with uh, abdominal pain and also we know that hyperglycemic emergencies both diabetic ketoacidosis and uh, hyposmotic uh, uh, coma can also present with abdominal pain and these are some uh, uncommon conditions or uh, uncommon presentation of common conditions uh, again presenting with uh, abdominal or upper abdominal pain uh, we should miss uh, we should not miss those things Uh, to name few are uh, uh, adrenal crisis sickle cell crisis thyroid toxicosis uremia aip hsp lead toxicity and hereditary angioedema and abdominal migraine so uh, my take home message is uh, evaluation of abdominal pain in the adult patient care can be a challenging task the initial evaluation should be directed towards excluding a uh, serious and life threatening pathology and cross collaboration between allied specialties namely surgery internal medicine uh, uh, gastroenterology radiology psychology and psychiatry is important in the effective management of this common presenting symptom and thank you now uh, i would like to uh, invite dr dinesh dharma vardhana to uh, join us with the uh, zoom uh, from australia over to you dinesh thank you aranga uh let me share my screen you know we have to make you host yeah okay uh. yeah Okay, Dinesh. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Let's see. Okay. Good afternoon to all of you. I'm joining in from down under. Um, nice to be in Sri Lanka, at least virtually. You know, I know all of you go through a bit of problems due to the financial gloom. Anyway, we'll write. Uh, we we'll get into the topic mimics of ischemic uh, pain that was the topic for today i think we don't need too much of uh, like uh, 
theoretical knowledge, we have to just see how when a patient presents to you with chest pain or some other like symptoms, you have to exclude uh, ischemic heart disease. That's the idea of this topic uh, presentation. So in myocardial ischemia, you all know that uh, you get chest uh, pain, tightness and various other symptoms. The pain part is still not fully understood because the heart is uh, getting afferent fibers via the vagus nerve and the sympathetic pathway. So uh, it's not fully understood as to how the pain is like uh, modulated and you know carried into the brain. But it's definitely not a somatic type of pain. So uh, as a result, uh, symptoms of myocardia vary substantially. You can get central typical chest uh, pain radiating to, radiate to jaw. If someone says that I get chest pain and it goes into my jaw and you know sometimes the teeth, you are hundred percent sure that's you know myocardial ischemia related pain. Other than that, you can get neck pain, shoulder pain, epigastric pain, some other symptoms like dyspnea or fatigue. Dr. Manil has already addressed that uh, symptom analysis. Uh, fatigue is like you get tired, uh, like you know doing a minor exertion. Then you can get palpitations, profuse sweating. Some people feel feverish. And then you get nausea, vomiting, especially in inferior MIs because uh, the inferior surface of the heart is you know, touching the diaphragm. So you can get nausea and vomiting. And then uh, most of all, uh, you, most importantly, you get sensation of doom, like feeling like something bad is about to happen. That is like, because maybe the, the mind is so related to the heart. So people feel like scared and apprehensive. So if you really ask, did you feel like you know, scared and all that? If say, patient says yes, then it's very likely that he's getting uh, uh, the symptoms from the myocardial ischemia. So it's not always pain. And also, uh, pain is not always myocardial infarction. So conditions mimicking myocardial infarctions, uh, esophageal reflux. Sometimes when you have the esophageal reflux, you can get pain. And also sometimes uh, people can get esophageal spasms. So it can really mimic like a you know, very tightening or crushing pain, but it's due to uh, esophageal spasm. So it can be re uh, relieved with uh, sublingual GTN as well. So sublingual GTN, uh, if the sublingual GTN relieves pain, it doesn't mean that it's a, it's a myocardial ischemic pain. So you can get pulmonary embolism, aortic dissection, musculoskeletal pain, psychological. I, I heard uh, Eranga touched on that as well. Then you can get pericarditis, pneumothorax, pneumonia. So the, those are all conditions which can mimic a myocardial infarction. So myocardial is, ischemia can present like other diseases and conditions. And also similarly, other diseases or conditions can present like a myocardial ischemia. So that is, there's a substantial overlap uh, between the symptoms. So it's very difficult. So you have to have a very low degree of suspicion when you are uh, uh, faced with a patient with uh, symptoms I discussed earlier. So in Sri Lanka, to you know, give some perspective about this uh, uh, situation in Sri Lanka, in Sri Lanka, we get about 25,000 uh, myocardial infarctions per year. That's about uh, 60 to, I mean, yeah, 60 to 80 cases of uh, stellation MI per day, uh, give or take. So that's a quite a substantial number. In Matale, we get one to two cases per day because in the last year, we have used only 300 vials of tenecticlase. So maybe we, we've used a less number of uh, vials due to late presentation as well. So, so it's a very uh, uh, important subject uh, as to how you analyze a patient's presenting symptom. So if you take the uh, symptom of pain, which is a subjective symptom, very subjective pain is a very subjective uh, symptom. Uh, some people pe feel pain, uh, their pain threshold is very low. So if you look at this uh, diagram, you can see uh, the probability of ischemia is high when you get central pressure type of pain, squeezing, gripping, heaviness, tightness, you know, exertion related retrosternal because that type of pain is very much likely uh, due to myocardial ischemia. Then as you go down the chart, you can see sharp, fleeting, shifting, pleuritic type of, you know, which is also related to precision and movement. The probability of, uh, you know, it being a myocardial ischemia related pain is very low. So in between you get a whole host of other things. Um, so this chart, if you can see through the you know different age brackets, you can see uh, most of the pains are actually not myocardial ischemia. 
you can see vast majority of you know patients presenting with uh, non specific chest pain they are not myocardial ischemia pain so that's something that you have to remember even uh, you know people who are more than 80 years of age uh, most of the time chest pain is not due to myocardial ischemia hence that's why we need like well trained doctors and you know emergency uh, department staff to you know pick the correct patient to admit and further and for further investigation so uh, these are the conditions which can present uh, like myocardial infarction you can say acute coronary syndrome of course that is you know very typical diaphoresis tachypnea tachycardia then pulmonary embolism they can have chest pain and tachycardia aortic dissection is very very classical they get ripping sudden onset pain which is so most of these aortic dissection patients you will you will never see in your outpatient clinics because they are too ill to present to the outpatient clinic they will straight away go to the emergency department you will see these patients in the emergency department or the ic usually they will never come to you um, sometimes they can die before coming to you so aortic dissection we hardly see in the outpatient department esophageal rupture yes it, they can present like myocardial infarction that is also very rare in the outpatient department because our uh, topic uh, is related to like primary care for the physician so is a general aortic dissection which is very very rare but acute coronary syndrome pulmonary embolism you may be able to see then conditions like chronic conditions like aortic stenosis how come they can present with chest pain then pericarditis myocarditis they are very common they can come to you as an outpatient then esophagitis gold bladder issues pneumonia pneumothorax i can tell you a story when i was in anuradhapura there was a child who was 15 years who came with uh, who had gone to a local hospital with chest pain and they had kept the child overnight and then you know did some investigations like ecg all the ecgs were normal and then he was sent home uh, on uh, painkillers and then uh, luckily he came to me the next day complaining of chest pain mother was unhappy that the pain doesn't disappear with paracetamol or any other painkillers so child was brought to me as an outpatient so i looked at him had a history it looked like a somatic sort of pain then anyway when i examined i realized that there was uh, like reduced air into on the left side of the chest so uh, then anyway when the patient comes to us with chest pain we do a echocardiogram i couldn't uh, find the heart in the normal position i thought it was shifted or either it should be either shifted or it should be case of dextrocardia the then i realized it's a shifted heart then i reexamined it's very important like uh, when you see a patient you take the initial history examine and do certain investigations then you have to reexamine with the uh, you know Uh, different diagnosis in mind so i reexamined confirmed pneumothorax and then i sent the child for a x-ray urgently and it was a tension pneumothorax had the child stayed at home or mother kept the child at home giving paracetamol the child could have died the, died the same night because you know once the hypoxia sets in and you know you go into cardiogenic shock you know the cascade has started and you you have very limit, little chance of recover i mean saving that child so luckily that uh, mother decided to bring the child that evening so that's a classic case where you could save lives in this situation there was another i can remember uh, i will discuss that costochondritis is a, like a minor ailment you can treat with simple analgesics then herpes zoster is another one i have come across a couple of patients coming with you know chest pain not to living to like simple paracetamol then to find out that they have blisters and all that so, so that's herpes zoster so there was another patient uh, during the covid peak times there was a, a lady who was about 60 years you know a uh, lot of the surgeons didn't like do uh, uh channeling uh, at the time obviously uh, for an understandable reason during the covid peak time so then the uh, staff brought her to me saying uh, uh, you are the only doctor can you see then i said what do you have then the patient had severe abdominal pain so i said i have nothing to do with the abdominal pains anyway since no one is there at least we'll do an ecg patient looked very ill i did the ecg turned out to be a massive anterior my ejection fraction was 30 i think if the patient stayed at home she could have like had major complications as well so this tells you like you know how atypically they present and uh, you know some degree of suspicion can save lives so if i didn't do the ecg her pain could have subsided anyway because myocardial infarction pain doesn't last forever but then she can die of an arrhythmia so 
to have a low degree of suspicion is a very important thing and you can save lives. If you save like one or two lives per year, I mean, that's fantastic, right? You know, you can't put a value to, you know, a life. So saving at least one or two lives is, you know, very rewarding and gratifying. So this chart tells you uh, things about that, you know, when they present with chest pain, you history and physical examination is very, very important. History can, you know, guide you towards certain diagnosis and then you confirm it with physical examination and then you do an ECG. That is what we expect from a primary care physician. You don't need to do like very extensive investigations. If you have a suspicion, then you send the patient to an emergency department. So you do an ECG. You know, when the patient presents to you, the target is to do an ECG within 10 minutes. That's the WHO standards. If you suspect this is something, this is possibly something cardiac, you have to do an ECG within 10 minutes. So if it is ST elevation MI, you, you know, do uh, refer the patient accordingly. So uh, I don't want to like dwell too much on this subject because, you know, our uh, scope is, you know, for the primary care physicians, you take a clinical history, make sure it's a visceral pain or it's a non-somatic pain. And then you like uh, do an ECG within 10 minutes of the first contact and repeat uh, if and when appropriate and do the physical examination. You can do bio cardiac biomarkers when available. Like if you have, the, if you have access to, high sensitivity troponins, you can virtually send the patient home without any added risk. If you don't have those things, you should always seek help. If you have any degree of suspicion, send the patient to an emergency department and get an ECG done and read by uh, someone who's like uh, capable of doing it. So uh, my uh, talk today expected uh, to tell you uh, things that, you know, the pain is not the only symptom in myocardial infarction. Similarly, uh, other sim uh, the pain can be due to other conditions as well. So have a good uh, high degree of suspicion, do an ECG, have a low threshold for ECG. It's a non-invasive, uh, very uh, low cost uh, uh, modality of investigation. I think every clinic can have an ECG, anyone can do an ECG. So do the physical examination and then uh, when appropriate, uh, when you have a doubt, always refer. So that way you can uh, minimize uh, death and you can improve prognosis. Because in myocardial infarction, uh, if you diagnose, you can improve their prognosis. If you miss the diagnosis, their prognosis can get affected. And uh, Prasanna was particularly interested in the young MIs and all that. So, uh, you know, coronary artery disease or atherosclerosis is a disease which starts very young. When you're around seven years, you have the fatty streaks. And then, you know, depending on the risk factors you have and the lifestyle you lead, you know, they, the, those fatty streaks develop into atherosclerotic plaques. And when you reach 40, you know, it keeps on growing. So it's like this, the uh, good analogy is like when you, all of us will start work at 30 years. Some people will learn more money. Some people will learn nothing, something like that. Your disease process starts very young and some, some people, you know, develop the disease very quickly and uh, aggressively. Some people you know, live a normal life. So uh, most of us may be having little plaques here and there. Doesn't mean that we have ischemic heart disease. So when you have the obstructive plaques on you, you develop symptoms. So very important to like uh, uh, lead a good lifestyle. So uh, Prasanna was very keen uh, to see whether we are actually seeing, a, you know, pandemic sort of uh, increase in uh, ischemic heart disease. I can say to an extent, yes, we, we are seeing increased number of young patients coming in. Overall, less than 40, we are seeing uh, out of all MIs, about 14% are younger than 50. So yeah, we are seeing increased number of uh, patients and younger patients have slightly better prognosis compared to the older patients because their other sy systems are supporting and uh, they have a better resource, but young people tend to get bigger MIs. Usually they have single vessel disease and all the people have like multi-vessel disease. So that's why their prognosis is slightly better. But you know, anyone can die of an MI because 11% uh, of people having an MI can die before reaching hospital. Why do they die? They don't die because of the heart failure. They die because of the lethal arrhythmias like ventricular tachycardia degenerating into ventricular fibrillation. Even the richest man can't buy even a second of life. So doesn't matter how rich you are, wherever you live, Australia, America, wherever, anyone can die of a heart attack before reaching hospital. So keep in mind, if you can catch a patient who's developing an MI, 
you know, you are saving lives. So always have a low degree of suspicion, you know, catch them as they develop it and then refer, then you can save lives. So I think this is what we expect from today's presentation. So thank you for paying attention. Thank you very much. Hello, guys. Hello. Can you all hear me? Yes, Dinush. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, elaborate presentation. Uh, please, please do uh, log in. Uh, we'll get back to you uh, for the discussion. We have a small presentation uh, by MONCD uh, RTHS Mathale on um, uh, national guidelines on NCD referral system. So he'll uh, uh, do th that presentation. And with that, uh, we'll come for a conclusion uh, or a uh, discussion right at the end. Please uh, do log in. Thank you very much. Over to you, Dr. Amir. Dinesh, can you put us as host? Mathalay Clinical Society. Actually, I'm not very familiar <laughs> with no. handling Zoom. So can you make me... Uh, uh, Just go to participants. From... Just go to participants. Yeah. Uh, and there is Mathalay Clinical Society on that. Yeah. yeah. And uh, on that, uh, there is a more. When you go to that, there is a more. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, say, uh, make host. Make host. Ah, yeah. I saw it. Yeah. All yeah. done. Yeah. Done. Okay. Thanks. Good afternoon to everyone. And thank you so much for the opportunity to a presentation here. And so I'm going to discuss about the cardiovascular prediction chart, how to use the cardiovascular risk prediction chart. It's mainly to uh, this cardiovascular risk prediction chart used to analyze whether the patient under risk of developing cardiovascular incidents. That is mainly the, that the patient might develop heart, pain, uh, heart attack or stroke. So this is uh, what we do is uh, we do conduct the screening program in our centers. Okay. Uh, centers that we have 35 institutions. Out of that, uh, one is general district general hospital, and other one is district based hospital. There are 33 primary care institutions. We have we conduct uh, healthy lifestyle centers, and uh, we conduct a screening program for apparently healthy patients. So this is what we do is in the conducting program uh, we. We have two categories of the people. One is age over 35, other category is less than 35. If the people under 35, between the 20 to 35, there are a few uh, categories. They are the only people we select for the screen purpose, of, especially smoking history within the one year and over age. I have mentioned here for the male and the females. And the raised blood pressure is more than 140 by 90. And the symptoms suggest of diabetes or history of premature cardiovascular disease. These are important for the history part because um, sometimes we miss, uh, but we all uh, teach about the uh, people who is screening the, our healthy lifestyle, especially public health nursing officers and the doctors. And again, the family health dyslipidemia. 
So you can see the dog I have uh, put this uh, uh, blue color one. The management of the category of the B, that's uh, between the 20 to 35, should if they found to have a high blood pressure, that's at least less than 104, more than 140 by 90, or diabetes, refer the patient with special units because we have to identify them secondary cause of this um, hypertension and other risk factors. Okay, moving to that though, the uh, next slides. This is uh, what, is, what uh, we do in our primary uh, care units. So uh, on my left side of the this, uh, slides, you can see this one. This is the peep, uh, these are the patients we discuss in the, you know, all the consultants discuss about the acute presentation of the, acute presentation of the present uh, conditions. And what we do in here, that screening purpose, uh, screening part, uh, if the patient don't, doesn't have any uh, acute presentation, what we do is we do the clinical assessment. And then after the clinical assessment, if the patient having again any risk factors, again we are, we are advised to refer these people to the uh, primary, secondary care, tertiary care hospital. Okay, moving to the next slide. So this is what I'm going to tell you about is a cardiovascular risk assessment chart. And here, there are two charts here. That uh, this is a uh, this is a WHO risk assessment chart here. So this is we can give an idea whether the patient has a risk has a risk of developing heart attack or stroke within the next ten years. This will give the percentage wise. But this cardiovascular risk assessment is not only only depends single factor. It's a multiple factors we have to consider. That's the important thing in the taking the history in the patients uh, clients, not the patients clients. Okay, uh, we have two charts. One is a laboratory-based chart, another one is a non-laboratory-based chart. Now, these non-laboratory charts are important nowadays. We don't have a glucose strips in our uh, peripheral units, and we have cholesterol receipt, so we can use this non-laboratory chart in uh, hospitals. Okay, this is a uh, chart here I mentioned here. If the patient has diabetes or high blood pressure, so these are uh, if the patient diabetes and the cholesterol is this available. Then we can use this chart. If they don't have, we have to use other one. So considering this, uh, if the patient we got the diagnosis of diabetes or hypercholesterolemia, so these are the factors. We have the inputs of the variables, and the age, sex, smoking status, and the presence or absence of diabetes, systolic blood pressure, total cholesterol. You can see this uh, multifactorial uh, things we consider to assess the CVD risk assessment, and uh, our outcome is whether the patient need a treatment or not treatment to prevent the risk. So steps one, what we do is, uh, suppose the patient has diagnosed diabetes patient with the RBS is more than 200 or with the fasting blood sugar 126. Now we use the first step, now patient diabetes. Next steps, what we do is, uh, now identify this male or female, or male or female. Then next steps, we go up whether it's a smoker or not. And uh, then we have to move into that uh, chart prediction. Now, is it like that? Uh, anti clockwise uh, way you have to assess this patient. Now, here this is then part, participant age group. Then now we go to the age group, then identify the risk. Now, with the cholesterol, if, if they give the cholesterol levels in the milligram, you have to change the millimole because the chart has a, a millimole and a, uh, not in the milligram. So now you see this is the chart. Now we have to assess now if the patient's have cholesterol between the 5 to 5.9, 5, uh, 5 to 5.9. And the blood pressure 140 by uh, between the 140 and 60. This patient has a five percent of the risk, uh, risk uh, within next ten years. He might develop the heart attack or stroke. So we'll discuss uh, now. This is the chart. If it is a green color, it's less than five percent chance. If it is yellow, five to ten percent. Orange, ten to twenty percent. Red, twenty to thirty percent. So the usually what we do is um, if the patient has red. We have to start the treatment or we have to immediately refer the patient to the specialist unit. And for example, this is a good idea. Even we have a lot of GPs also. We can get an idea whether to treat or not, whether to refer or not. This is the example you can identify. You know, this will give a good um, eye opening. For example, this patient says uh, he's 56 year old, he relatively young patient, smoking three cigarettes per day, blood pressure 140, 5490, uh, and the glucose is 230. And the, Cholesterol levels. This we only assess the total cholesterol level. We don't do the in the screening purpose. We do we don't do the LDL level. So this is a chart we use. It's a diabetic chart. The chart is a uh, lab chart. And male patients steps four steps I have mentioned earlier. 
now this day channel 29 percent risk even though it's a middle age young patient he has a risk of uh, developing mio heart attack uh, or a stroke is 29 percent so this patient need a immediate referral or start treatment and refer the patient and the treatment guidelines so we have available for our primary sex, uh, care uh, unit people but i don't discuss because I'm, it's not ethical it should be con, uh, done by the consultant so this is a non laboratory chart based for example we'll use this one uh, for example 62 year patient father of three and his weight is 67 height is 160 cm the bmi become is 26.2 and blood pressure is 160 by 95 uh, double check and uh, we don't have a sugar or cholesterol level. Now, here is the main important factor is a uh, body mass index. So, you have to know the body mass index, you have to calculate the body mass index, then only you can uh, use this uh, non laboratory chart here. So, here you can see this one. If you put into all the things, now this patient become CVD risk is 20 percentage. So, that in, again, the patient is a uh, more likely to develop a heart attack or stroke, 20% chance within the next 10 years. So this patient also need a, a referral or start treatment. But usually what we recommend is uh, if the patient don't have a cholesterol or glucose level, then the better to refer this patient to this specialty unit, then they are, you have to do the immediate investigation, then they start the treatment. Okay, another one example, or another one factors also, you can see this one uh, for the male and the females also, if you the same age group, same blood pressure, but uh, if you see this patient, uh, uh, you can see this 14 and then 19. So the male, uh, apparently they are more, uh, is it, for instance, they have the more risk than the um, females. And you can go see here, if your patients have, if you can, patient can put this, put in the smoking for one year, you can see this uh, reduction of the CVD risk. So early 20%, now we become 13%. Again, after treatment, if you can reduce the blood pressure from 160 to 140, again, you reduce the risk from 21 to 16. So these all factors, this is a multifactorial uh, test, uh, factors we consider to the CVD risk assessment chart. And here you can, you can appreciate all the things in this lifestyle modification, in the treatment, immediate treatment, and timely treatment, all consider patient, uh, uh, whether patient develop mortality, morbidity, and reduce the uh, risk of developing the uh, car, major cardiac events. Okay. For, uh, for the summary, of a laboratory based charts, we should have cholesterol and the uh, blood sugar level. And in the non laboratory chart, the main is the BMI. The decision should be made by the laboratory chart to treat the patient and refer the patient. But in the non laboratory chart, it is to refer the patients. And we have the uh, ones to identify the risk factors and the risk categories. These are the two books. So this is for the Females and it's for the female. We document everything and send the patient, refer the patient, appropriate uh, uh, clinic so uh, specialist. So in summary, uh, in general, in general, male is more risk than the females developing cardiac vascular event, and as aging, there is a high risk for the severe risk uh, cardiovascular event. And in smoking, is the main of the main risk factor, and is a uh, modified risk factor as well. And again, the BMI. Uh, high the blood pressure, high the risk. So we can treat the patient, and there's again salt um, reduction, everything that's also important in the management, uh, both uh, the, both the pharmacologic and non pharmacologic treatment. And again, the uh, sex and the age, others, most of the things are modified risk factors. So we can reduce the cardiovascular event by lifestyle modification in the pharmacologic treatment. Okay, uh, thank you. That's all. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Amir. Uh, so, uh, hello, uh, Dinesh, can you hear me? Are you still there? Thank 
Sun. Right. Until uh, Dr. Dinesh Dharma joins us again, do you all have any uh, questions uh, regarding uh, the mimics of ischemic heart disease? Open for discussion. Uh, Dr. Manesiris and uh, Dr. Talagal is there. Any practical uh, problems that you all come across uh, in managing uh, people uh, or patients? Yes. Uh, out of these five, uh, one had diabetic, poorly controlled diabetic. The others, uh, the last one that I did was the elder brother had ischemic heart disease, but he was also young. Probably familial hypercholesterolemia is the main cause. And out of these young, I didn't find uh, risk factors such as diabetes, hypertension, smoking on the others, except that lady who had poorly controlled diabetes. So most of them, when we get, we call it uh, sudden cardiac death. When we get sudden cardiac death, less than 50, uh, some of them, it can be the first, first incident. So they may not be investigated on their cholesterol level. So we advise, it, it can be a familial hypercholesterolemia, it's like that. So we advise the immediate family members to get screening. So out of these five, there was one had diabetes, the other one had uh, probably familial hypercholesterolemia. But they were not, uh, though the elder had uh, uh, young hypercholesterolemia, uh, they had not, the doctor had not uh, asked about the family and they have not referred properly. I had a sim not this one, I had a similar case. A father who was a medical rep died in a party in a hotel. He was in the toilet. You know, straining causes arrhythmia. And when I looked, he had four cups. The sad story is the two kids of that father were diagnosed with four cups. And was the father was not even they I don't know why didn't they investigate. Probably they were since it's pediatric, they would have, I don't know whether they have forgotten or not. No, so always think about uh, family and ask about the family. Tell them to get medical referral, you know. So these are good uh, take home messages, you know. Due to technical reasons, Dr. Dinesh Dharmathana has uh, left the Zoom meeting. Uh, so, do you all have any other questions? In the absence of any question, uh, I would like to invite uh, Secretary of uh, Mathali Clinical Society, Dr. Alex Samarakun, uh, 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 to de uh, deliver the word of thanks. Thank you very much.
you, sir. Uh, good afternoon, all. Thank you so much for the fabulous, great presentation done by the by all the consultants and uh, the Kami and NCT today. This knowledge would have uh, make a significant impact on the uh, patient management uh, further in a better way, I suppose. Uh, we truly appreciate Dr. Prasanna Abduhani, consultant JMO, uh, DJ Chmatale, for taking uh, an initiative for today's symposium. He has a lot of concerns uh, on this as he experienced significant number of premature cardiac deaths for a, a short period of time, uh, and uh, which would have been prevented, I suppose. And uh, he took great effort to start this symposium to uh, our following discussion with various uh, units. And uh, I would say uh, it had been successful. Uh, this uh, started because uh, uh, to in order to explore and uh, strengthen the knowledge you have. And thank you very much, sir, for your effort. I would like to convey my sincere gratitude to all the consultant uh, and the speaker, uh, Dr. Amit. Uh, today, uh, Dr. Manil Piri, consultant respiratory physician, Dr. Dinush Dharmwardana, uh, who was consultant cardiologist uh, uh, for joining us by Zoom, and Dr. Iranga Talagala, consultant endocrinologist, for making this effort very successful. On the other hand, I must remind Dr. Kapil Diyagis, the consultant physician, for supporting by getting down sponsorships uh, for, the, to, for today's program. Thank you, sir, for your kindness. Uh, at the same time, I would thank uh, today's sponsor, uh, Raptacos Breath and uh, Company, uh, for giving uh, their hands for the uh, program and uh, their product, including Durali, PR, isoflave PR, subsides PR, white SLN, catoxy cap N. Sorry for the uh, pronunciation. Not only that, it's uh, really great uh, pull that uh, Dr. Amal Tilakaratna, Vice President uh, NCS, uh, who guides and uh, accompany clinical pathway continuously. And appreciate very much, sir. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Director uh, DJ Matale, raising this occasion, uh, and uh, RDHS Matale for uh, participating, all the peripheral unit doctors for this program, which will make benefit for their uh, further uh, management. And um, appreciate all the uh, peripheral doctors and all the audience who are presenting here today for your participation. And uh, not only that, I must thank Dr. Manil Piris and Dr. Ananda for taking their effort to uh, uh, have the technical part very smoothly uh, and uh, as usual. And uh, thank you very much uh, all. A few announcements. Uh, next uh, Art Circle the program will be on 30th uh, photography, which will be coordinated by Dr. Chandana, consultant radiologist. And uh, uh, yes, that's all. Uh, I thought of uh, having a small discussion um, of, by, uh, with the Clinical Society Council members, but I don't think the time will not permit uh, as it has gone beyond our limit. So we'll have next time. We have a few uh, points to be discussed and we'll have an, another day. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, your lunch will be ready. Take it off. Thank you.